enjoying the sun, Frank? What sun? <laughs> I haven't been alive. Get some tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, we're live, live on YouTube now. It's been cloudy for the last three days, more or less, here. Good evening and welcome to the meeting of the Folkestone and Hyde District and Parish Councils Joint Committee. Please note this meeting is being streamed live to the internet. Please could all members ensure their microphone is set to mute unless they are speaking to reduce any background noise. Also ensure any other devices nearby are switched to silent. Members should use the raise hand button if they wish to speak. And if we come to the first item on the agenda, which is of a chairman for this evening, which is the parish council's turn. Can I have your nominations, please. Councillor Hobbs. Thank I you. And a, and a seconder. I'll second that. Thank you, councillors. And anybody object to that? Thank you. Evening, Jenny. I'll hand over to you. Cheers, Kate. Uh, just like to, the second one isn't here at the moment, but just like to welcome Councillor Mike Moore of Lynn Parish Council to this committee. Do you know the rest of them, Mike? You're on mute. You're on mute, Mike. You're still muted. So I'll just absorb things this time and get the... Uh the swing and the procedures. Okay. Apologies for absence. You had any, Kate? Yes, we have. We've had apologies from Councillor Matthews this evening. Thank you. Any declarations of interest on the agenda items that we've got? Evening, Terry. <coughs> <coughs> Are there any decorations? No shaking of heads, no raised hands. That must be the none. Minutes of the meeting held on the 18th of March. They have been circulated and you should have all seen them. Are you happy with them to be signed as correct record of the last meeting? I'd like to propose them as a true and accurate record of the meeting of the 18th of March, Frank. Thank you, Paul. Second. Happy to second. Thank you, Jenny. All in favour? Yep. Nobody against? Uh, you heard earlier uh, that the waste management item on the agenda is not coming forward. Perhaps, Kate, you could explain it better than I can. Um, so you and you and Green was uh, going to take that forward. I think that is going to come to committee in September. Um, at the moment, they're in the process of overview and scrutiny task and finish groups. So um, once they've uh, come to their conclusions on those, and I think our report will come to this committee in September. So I'll make sure it's on the agenda. Thank you. The first item then is grass cutting, which I believe is Andy. Thank you, Councillor Hobbs. Um, it's, it's not just about grass cutting, it's looking at the grounds maintenance service, how oh, we yeah, provide yeah. those services across the district <laughs> and all of the heading, all. all of the environmental initiatives um, that we undertake. And Alistair Clifford, who's the operations lead specialist, is going to take you through um, some slides. Evening, Councillors. Kate, could you enable me to share, please? All done. Thank you. Right, hopefully you're all seeing my screen. Um, so there's a lot in this. I'm going to fire through. Uh, Kate will distribute it round to you afterwards. Um, and obviously at the end, happy to take, more than happy to take any questions. So I thought I'd introduce you first of all, just quickly to how many officers we have in the team and how we split up. 
we have around about in the summer season around about 50 odd staff and uh in the winter we reduce that down to around about 30. we work pretty closely with the white cliffs countryside partnership and the romney mass countryside partnership to look after our sites we split our teams uh into quite a few different routes, um, depending on what they do. Again, I won't go into them, but that's more for your information after, so you can get an understanding of, of how we work and what areas we look after in, in, in individual pieces. This one here I thought would be quite good to understand how we work throughout the year, really, and sort of some of the key parts that we do. Now, obviously, some works go on all year round. We have the toilets, we have, you know, gr grass cutting, we were cutting grass in January this year, which is pretty unheard of. Um, but if you look at this timeline um, as we move across from the, through the year, we, we, we obviously have 24 seasonal staff that we bring in. We start the recruitment process late January, early February, the advertising. Um, and, we, and we look to bring those in from the 1st of April before the real grass cutting season. So we, we were on top of it before it even gets too long. We look after the Great Stone Dunes and do a lot of work down there every February to make sure that they work as a sea defence and to make sure that ecology they are well looked after. Uh, we, we consider our key growing season and our key season for grass to be from now mid-March and through till late September. We have found over the last four to five years that's extended out um, quite considerably. Um, probably probably due to climate change. It can be, it does vary from season to season. I'm sure you're aware this season has been a particularly tough one. We uh, put the summer bedding in, in early July. That takes pretty much everybody out for a week, up to two weeks, depending on how fast we do it. We have green flag judging for our green flag parks, such as uh, the Coastal Park, uh, Radnor Park, and the Canal. We move on to hedge cutting, in sort of late August, September after the bird seasons um, and when we were legally allowed to do it. The, the seasonal staff finish around September and we go back down to our permanent members of staff. The winter bedding goes in in October. Now, obviously, that doesn't just, you know, we don't just put the plants in. We have to strip out the old bedding. We have to put the, the um, compost into the ground and stuff like that. The, the tree planting then starts in November for any work we do. And then the winter works uh, start, such as the large hedge cutting and stuff like that, December, January, February. And then, uh, we, then we go again. It's a very cyclical cycle. Um, so I mentioned there a minute ago that we've got our green uh, flag parks in the district, uh, the Lower Lees Coastal Park, the R Royal Military Canal, Radnor Park. We have applied for Kings North Gardens. We've just had the judging. We don't find out to October, but I think if uh, most of you hopefully have been to Kings North, it's absolutely stunning. A lot of work's gone in from officers this year and, and the community. So fingers crossed we get that. Now, we maintain as a district, um, not just our own areas, but we also do a lot of work on behalf of KCC. We also do work for Hive Town Council and Folkestone Town Council. We have no control over those contracts and the grass verges that they do. KCC pay us to undertake um, grass cutting for a 35 week period, which equates to about six cuts per year. Now, as a district, we top that up to 10, maybe 12, depending on how we get on each year um, to keep the basically keep the district looking good. We've got a, quite a few nature reserves in the district. We've got the Folkestone Warren, which is a triple SI, which has been managed by the White Cliffs Countryside Partnership since 1989. We've got, um, down on the marsh, we've got Great Stone Dunes, we've got Great Stone Beach, we've got the Warren Country Park, uh, and these are triple SI, Ramsars, SAC and SPC, and they've been managed by the Romney Marsh Countryside Partnership since 2006. Uh, I'll go into some of the environmental initiatives that we've been um, doing lately and uh, for quite a few number of years, actually. So green waste and compost, we compost uh, around about 95% of everything that we produce, primarily up at Hawkins Depot. We've got a large site up there. We've been doing that since 2010. Um, it's got huge, huge benefits. We use it to mulch. Uh, we use it to put around the plants. We use it to compost into our sites. It stops weeds. It stops us having to use so much um, 
weed killer and stuff like that. And what we've done in the last few years is put some mini depots into places like East Cliff and Kings North, which means that we've stopped a lot of the movement of vehicles around the district to try and reduce our carbon footprint a little bit more. Biodiversity. I mean, we've got so much going on in the district uh, for this, for ecology, for biodiversity, for everything. You know, the Royal Military Canal has been managed for 15 years um, as a, you know, for ecology, ecology primarily. It is um, stunning and it's been really good. We've worked a lot with the EA in the last few years to train officers, to train staff in how to manage it um, and to manage it primarily for ecology. Uh, we, there has been species counts. We're due another one this year. We hope, we're hoping to do it last year to see how we're increasing. Um, but every, every time we've done it, it's been really positive. Obviously, the Warren and the East Cliff is a nature reserve and, and is managed for such. And the coastal park has its own areas within it. Peat. Peat's pretty bad for the environment, digging up the ground. So we, we try not to use it. It's, it's particularly hard for bedding to get it, but we have been, you know, we've we've spoken to our suppliers. We only buy from those that are aiming to reduce it, and quite a lot of it has come down. And we've been pretty impressed with the quality of the summer bedding and winter bedding that we've got. And again, this year, I think it looks absolutely fantastic. The stuff that we've done, uh, seed and roofs. I quite like these. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen them in, but we've we've used these in a number of places now including the new beach huts down on the coastal park. And they've really brought it together. I, I watched it and I was amazed by just how many bees and stuff were using it as like a little micro environment. So that's really good. Uh, it'd be nice to see us, if we can, to use this on, on any new builds, anything that we, we bring in and grounds maintenance and stuff like that. Waste management, uh, obviously we don't run the whole waste management contract, but we do look after our parks, um, a few seafront locations and things like that. So. We've worked really hard to make sure that we've got recycling points in place. We've got the big belly bins and the compactors in places like the Coastal Park. Um, and we've introduced more and more, you know, things to try and reduce littering and, and waste within our parks. Tree stock, um, considerable amount of trees. You know, the, the, the figures on here are, are staggering. You know, we've got 22,000 trees within you know, places like the Royal Military Canal and the Leeds Escarpment. We've got 3,800 trees in our parks and open spaces individually identified. You know, last few years, we've, we've planted 1,500 odd trees. So, you know, a really good effort has gone into making that um, and to, to keep moving through and to keep going with the planting regime is going to be really, really good. Grass cutting reductions then. So we, we cut about 2 million linear metres of grass every three to four weeks across all our contracts, which is a huge undertaking. We've worked um, in the past with Kent on the Plan B initiative, um, which you will now probably see rolling out in a lot of uh, other districts. But we were the first to do that down on the marsh with them. We've done about 70 kilometres where we've reduced the, the mowing regime. That was hugely popular, hugely um, good for the environment. And it's nice to see that moving out. It was really nice to be involved in the pilot. But we haven't just stopped there. We've been working to identify sites elsewhere. We've identified four large sites in Folkestone. Lately, we've got a list of stuff to work through for Hive, where we could look at it. And we, you know, because a lot of the verges aren't our contracts, we have to work with KCC and town councils to, to identify them, make sure that they're safe, make sure that they're in the right setting but there are opportunities and we will continue to work through those. You'll probably see around the district, these be kind signs popping up all over the place. Um, we, we've got them in places like Kings North, we're using them in Hawkinge. And these are just to let people know that we're not just not cutting the grass. This is left for a reason. Um, it seems to be going down very well. When we put these up, we get a lot less complaints from people who said, oh, you haven't cut the grass, you have cut the grass. So these are really good. Just because they're pollinator sites doesn't mean that we cannot keep to look after them and does not mean that we can't have to cut them. We still do have to cut them uh, once or twice a year. So, you know, you, you usually get a few people asking why have you cut them, but there is a reason for it. Um, and then finally, you know, equipment. We've been looking and testing and trialing equipment for quite a few years um, in terms of electric equipment. We've bought quite a lot of the smaller stuff now. 
the team are, are pretty fond of it and we're hoping in the next few years that the the larger um scale equipment moves towards electric away from petrol and diesel i mean prime example you know you've got a nice park in kings north where everyone's enjoying themselves and you've got a noisy old uh <laughs> hedge cutter running in the corner a quite electric one's nicer from that point as as well so that's me firing absolutely fast through because there's a lot in there and I say you will get it, but I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I'll stop sharing. Uh, if I can ask a, a very quick one, um, it's a matter of what what is an open space and what's not an open space. Now, I, I know, but um, I live in Dimchurch, I'm a Romney Master Councillor, and all I will say is that along the new sea wall, um, behind the sea wall rather, certainly behind Selvis Close, which is where I live, um, the grass and weeds are a metre high. Um, somebody, and I've only just noticed it today, somebody has kindly cut back the, the, the part, the steps going up to the sea, sea wall were pretty well covered in weeds and nettles somebody has actually gone out and cut that down and cut back a metre with a, a little scribbled note on the on the floor saying, thank you, Bernie. Now, I don't know who Bernie is, but whoever he is, he's done a good job. And all I would say is that there's a lot of stuff there that needs cutting, ideally taken away. Um, what's the sort, and, and I think you tend to tackle that about every six months. What is the time frame for cutting along the seawall from, let's say, Dimchurch Village along along to Redell? That's the question. Andy, you've got your hand up. Did you want to answer that? Or Yeah, I can answer that. Um, thank you, Councillor Mullard. We'll have to look into the specific site. There's a lot of um, shared ownership down there between us, the EA, and other landowners. Um, now, I would suspect if it hasn't been cut for six months, it won't be ours. Um, I know some of our grass is long, but um, we won't have left it for six months. I suspect um, we'd have to look into it, but I suspect that will be Environment Agency. Um, but I say, if you put the details over to Ali in an email, we can look into it and respond outside of the meeting. You're right. It tends to be the Environment Agency that you know that does the cutting up there. Um, I suspect a lot of... Uh, Sorry, our, cat, our cat loves it because it's a sort of a hunting ground for him. A lot of the um, coastal stuff down there is cut by the EA. Uh, a lot of the stuff on the marsh we tend to do. Um, we've obviously got our housing sites and we do a lot of the, um, the KCC grass, but most of the open spaces down there are not in our ownership. Yeah. EA. Thank you. Yeah. Paul and Graham. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Frank. Yeah, um, first of all, can I say thank you very much, uh, uh, Alistair and, and, and Andy. Um, th there's great communication between the, the guys that are doing the, um, the uh, grounds maintenance work and the litter pickers, for example, um, and they're working really well together now so that the litter pickers are saying they're not ending up having to take out shredded aluminium cans and plastic. So I think that's a real positive for the for the district in terms of working with with that particular group just it just goes to show what you can do when you when you work together but my question really relates to something um that i i've been watching over a period of time on on the canal and that's to do with the invasive species of weed which has caused a particular problem is there something that is going to be done specifically with that or what can be done to prevent the um you know, the spread of that particular weed, which is it's more noticeable this year than, than it's ever been. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Thomas. I, I can answer that one. So we've got two invasive species on the canal. One that we've been dealing with for quite a, a while, the floating penny wart, which we, we manage fairly well. Um, and then we've obviously discovered the new one this year, which has been really, really difficult. Um, it, it sprung up out of nowhere. We engaged with the Environment Agency really early on to ask them for support uh, in how to manage it. They basically said that the country is inundated with this one this year. It's just been perfect growing seasons for it. And obviously we'd never even noticed it before this year. So we've worked to, um, we, well, we've had a free man team on the canal for about a month every day for extended hours, um, 
breaking it up and, and, and getting it rid of it as much as we can. Now, obviously, this stuff likes to break up and it likes to float downstream. So it's been a bit of an ongoing battle. The team have worked really hard to, to, to stop an absolute disaster of what it can become. You know, we, we have identified a few fish, you know, that have died, unfortunately. But what it could have been if we'd have left it unchecked is unbelievable. We have some weevils coming. That is the DEFRA recommended approach to getting rid of this. Um, they are arriving in August. So until then, we just need to keep the manual work up, but hopefully moving forward, we'll have a solution. Oh, yeah, thank you very much for that, Alice. That's a very comprehensive response. Thank you. So let's hope the weevils don't end up like the cane toads in Australia, right? Eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, thank you, Alistair. Appreciate that. Graham, then Mike. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we do appreciate the work that the district do with the, the grounds throughout, throughout the area. And the, the colour is quite magnificent this year. But when I come back to St Mary's Bay, I find the middle of St Mary's Bay, the grass was lo left long. It was cut very ragged. And when you look at the bay, We've got private houses that do cut the grass in front of their properties. The hall has a regular cut. It doesn't bode well look for the area. Is there a, a reason why we're, we're left like that? Uh, yeah, thank you, Councillor Hudson. I think that this year has been particularly challenging um for the for the whole grounds maintenance i mean you probably all look after your own gardens everything's been going absolutely uh you know flat out and the teams have been doing overtime we've been putting weekend work on to try and keep on top of it but what happens is when the grass grows longer than the machines can ideally cut is that we as we cut through it a lot of it just folds over uh you come back the next day and it's sprung back up so not only does it take longer to cut when you're there because it's longer it also means you have to come back and do it again. So most sites had to have a double visit to start looking good. Now we always try to run our teams together. So we don't just go through and cut the grass and then turn up four days later with a strimmer to strim around the edges. We, we try to keep those teams working back to back so that it always looks nice and as consistent as possible. But this year has been particularly challenging. We've had to pull a few people off to do, you know, to do other sites, to, to go on the canal, extra work. Um, and to keep up with the speed of it so yeah it has been it has been hard um if there's any particular sites that you've got you know issues with then yeah do get do send them over to me and we can have a look what's going on but you know we'd, we'd, i would say the teams are doing absolutely their, their flat out best at the moment yeah i appreciate your comments but this comes up pretty regularly almost every year right Okay. Yeah, if you could if you could identify the sites for me, we can look at what we do manage. That'd be useful to understand. As as Andy said earlier, we 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 only have so many land holdings, so it's, it's working out if we're missing something or we're we're you know doing something in a different different order may work better. Can I just come in? Can I come in here as well, please? Yeah, go ahead, Andy. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, and I think um. Councillor Allison, the grass that you're referring to, as Ali pointed out in his presentation, is um, it will be KCC verges predominantly, um, as as is the case with most of the grass cutting that we carry out on the marsh, um, and we are only actually paid six to cut that grass six times a year. So anything that we do do is an excess as that is it, is at the district expense for cutting somebody else's asset. So as I say, I mean. We have had um, phenomenal problems this year with um, keeping on top of the grass. We're getting there now, I think. I drove around big parts of the district about three weeks ago, uh, and I drove around again um, yeah, towards the end of last week, and um, there was significant improvements in everything that I saw. Um, but I say, if you, if you put your specific inquiries through to Valley, we will have a look. But um, it is worth remembering that we are actually only paid to cut this grass six times a year, and it is a KC, predominantly a KCC asset. Yeah, I appreciate you know what what you say, but we're trying to make the villages attractive, uh, and you know when you see the long grass and the ragged look, it, it it's difficult to explain to to our residents. Yeah, and the fully appreciate. Fully and appreciate the, what you're and saying. The, 
and the parish councillors are the first in line because we were about the village. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank I you. Fully appreciate that. We'll take a look. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Mike. Uh, yeah, it's not so much a question, really, as a plea for help. Uh, at Lim, we've got no um, sites that are maintained by the district, but we've got a six hectare playing field that the Lim Parish Council actually maintains and pays for the grass cutting. Now, we've got um, major plans for that area, space for all. So we've already planted 47 native trees, and I, I can confirm in uh, dry weather, it's a, it's a task to keep them watered and uh, stop yep. them wilting. Uh, Dave Sefton's given us a little bit of advice on that. Uh, we've put in, we're going to about to put in a 400 metre bound gravel walking track. Um, we're also going to plant up a wild meadow area. We're going to put in a sensory garden for people with uh, disabilities. Uh, and obviously there's hedgerow. So we're we're all acting uh, with good intention but we're all amateurs so it's a matter of whether you can give us any support by the way of advice um as we push this project forward uh, we've also already put in nine uh, benches that made out of recyclable plastic and i did notice your two big bins there uh, with the slot entrances into and we're keen to get one of those there because one of the problems we've had in lim during the shutdown is that the uh, zoo park free walk has been put on the internet and literally we're getting everybody from outside the county coming to do this walk and we've been overloaded on occasions at them and litter has been a problem because they park up in the uh, Lim Village Hill car park which is the start of the walk so the bins there just haven't been significant or large enough so really it's a plea for a bit of advice really and any support you can give us uh, the cutting and that we pay for ourselves, but obviously we're, we're in need of advice, I think, really, to progress the scheme. Thank you, Councillor Board. Yeah, I mean, the, the bins are from a company in Lim, so you might have an in there. You might be able to, uh, I think they're Metro Store or something like that. It might be. I can, I can, yeah, I'll have a look. But, yeah, they definitely came from Lim. They were a local company, and they've been a really good product, actually, and they're really good to work with. In terms yeah. of advice, I don't see that should be a problem. You've already spoke to Dave, he's so knowledgeable. And we've also got Jana, who, who's our horticultural manager, and she looks after a lot of the parks that we do. And she understands plants and, and planting and everything like that fantastically. So if you if you drop me a, an email, I'm sure we can, we can sort some advice out, no problem. Thank you for that. Anything else? Anybody? Well, the only comment I would make, and it's not a, a focus on a high problem, it's KCC who are doing it, is that the reverse cutting this year has been a bit haphazard. We seem to have done a bit here, a bit there, a bit somewhere else. I think when he first came around our area, he was learning how to do the job because he, every now and then he, would, he was um, taking a long time to do a short stretch, fiddling about with his machine on the back of the tractor. I could give him a few lessons with mine, but Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Alistair and Andy. If there's nobody else, nothing, no, oh, sorry, Laszlo's got his hand up. Yeah, just to thank you, thank you, Alistair, for an excellent presentation. And I can vouch for the fact of the size of the grass on my lawn that uh, it's been a difficult job with the, with the rain that we've had and the fact that you couldn't probably get out um, before the next showers came along. So uh, thank you very much for all your hard work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Right, we move on then to the Council Housing Landlord Service, which is John Holman, and possibly Gavin. Yes, yes, Chair, thank you. Um, I will share my screen. Is that okay? Can we see that? Yeah. I'll just. Uh... You get into the presentation. OK. 
Good. Is that um, is that coming across okay, Andy? Yep. Okay. Yeah, John, you've got the you've got the um the small slide bit coming up on the next slide. I don't know if you can get rid of that. Yeah. I think what I've done here. What I've done, I've shared the other screen. I've got the I've got the complete um Right. I know that shouldn't be there, but that's that's a, probably as go good to, as go to the slideshow tab and start it from there, John, just at the top next to animations. Yeah. No, 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 come across where the words are down slideshow. There. Got it. Yeah, try that one. This one here from just the beginning. From the beginning. No. Nope. That normally okay. works. Last chance, I'll try and, oh, there we go. Right. Okay, Chair Members, very good to see you. Thank you very much um, for inviting us along uh, this evening. Um, I think what I'll do, if it's okay, I'll, I'll run through the presentation and then take questions at the end, uh, as, as Ali did, that seems to work well. Um, these are the areas for, for, for discussion, and, and that's very much our, our vision, and I'll touch on that throughout the presentation. I think before I start, it's uh, you, you probably experienced a lot more of the uh, service that uh, East Kent were providing in the latter years than, than I'm aware of, and, and you'll maybe be aware of the reasons why it was brought back in-house, but we'll explore that. I think importantly for me as um, a housing professional is that housing is, is fundamental to, to you know, good society. You, good housing, warm housing, housing that's not damp um, kind of means that we've got um, children that can stay at home, do their homework, not on the streets, uh, good health and all those things. And bad housing um, is the opposite. And therefore, we're all about providing good housing and we do provide good housing. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done on it and we'll explore that in a minute. And what's critical for us is that our tenants are at the heart of everything that we're, we're doing. So I'm uh, going to talk about the, the history, how we've got here, um, what the council did, taking a very, very brave move to, to bring the service back in-house and it's certainly working out the right way. A bit of detail on the size of the service that uh, we're, we're now operating and we're a medium-sized landlord and then how the service works, how we're working with tenants and then our, our performance. And then excitingly, I think um, at the end, uh, the, uh, the look forward, what all the things we're going to be doing uh, in the future. So history, um, we were part of, Folkestone were part of this large Almo, 17,000 homes. The regulator, the regulator of social housing that regulates all of the social housing across the country, whether you're a local authority or whether you are a housing association, the regulator of social ha housing, make sure that tenants um, are getting a, a fair deal. And so we are a regulated service and the regulator can and does and frequently steps in where performance is not, not adequate. So we had, as Folkestone, along with all the other councils in the Almo, reached what is called the home standard. And that's, that's quite well uh, described. They served then, the regulator served the, uh, the notice on us, and potentially they were saying we were um, not providing a safe service. So around the fire, around the lifts and water and, and gas safety, they were not confident that we were providing a safe service. And therefore we then entered into a voluntary undertaking. We said, yes, we accept what you're saying, and we're gonna enter into a voluntary undertaking to address these, these matters. Um, and then I, I came in in um, uh, May, 2020 to work with Andy to set up the new the new housing service. Now, you'll know we've got a housing service already that looks after temporary accommodation, rough sleepers. That was always in the in, in the council, and we combined that service with the landlord service, the council housing, which I'm going to talk about primarily for the rest of uh, the the evening here in this presentation. So it was the the housing service, the council housing that was coming back into the council, and that's about 3,400 homes. Um, we've got a combined service, including the strategic side that's already there, of about 98 staff. Um, now, the income from rents from, from our council tenants 
is about 16 million pound a year. And we spend about 9.9 .9 million on um, day-to-day -day repairs, on the staffing, on the, um, you know, we, we would pay for our grass cutting, for example. Um, and then we spend about 15 million on the major, the major work. So that would be the new build, that would be replacing roofs, replacing the uh, windows and everything else. And we let something like uh, 197 homes annually. So tenants move out and we, we, we go in and uh, repair homes. And that's currently a challenge for us to turn those around quickly. Because uh, every day that the home is empty, uh, it's lost revenue for us. And we carry out about 7,400 repairs annually. And you'll know me as um, carry out those for us. And then just looking at that, um, pie chart there it gives an idea of the uh, stock we've got so most of our houses like like uh, an awful lot of uh, district councils like like us um a majority of their stock is um housing we have quite a lot of flats and we have quite a large proportion of flats which are sheltered housing as well quite a lot um of sheltered housing is flats and therefore uh, has a particular uh, high high demand on on the uh, on, on the service it's got lifts it's got um uh, fire equipment. It's got a whole load of work that um, is uh, needs to be looked after and replaced and, and repaired on a day-to-day -day basis. And then um, a, a few uh, a few bungalows and a smattering of other other properties. The bed sits, for example, those blue ones are a particular problem for us. Um, you know, they're historic. Lots of their stock is just post-war, and um, people don't want to live in bed sits anymore. So we, we need to be thinking about how we're going to be doing something around that. And we've currently got a, a review going on. So how the service works, um, what, what, what we did to start with, um, we, we consulted with the tenants. We wanted to understand how, how they would like us to work. And what we've done is set up a, um, a neighborhood approach to uh, our management. So we've got patches and in each, in each of those patches, we have a housing officer and a surveyor. And they, they own the patch, they, they interact with the tenants, they understand what's going on. They follow up on uh, work that he's doing. They'll follow up on antisocial behavior, um, graffiti. They'll make sure repairs are done. They'll post inspect repairs from the contractor. Tenants report stuff centrally through a central call point. So if they've got a repair, they'll, they'll phone or email uh, that in and uh, it's put then either through to the contractor or we deal with it um, with, a, with um, other contractors. But we carry out major works, so the roofing, uh, the replacement of windows, doors, fireworks. We carry that out across the district. Uh, and there's a separate capital works team that deals with all the major works. And in the same way, we deal with our compliance, the health and safety, the things which got us into trouble in the first place, not making sure our gas was inspected and serviced annually. Uh, that's a team that works across uh, the district as well. And we have specialists that look after electric, look after gas, look after fire. We're training staff in, in that. Any new build we do, of course, is across the district. And then sheltered housing is a, is a separate team, comes under an individual uh, manager. Work is carried out by contractors and we publish all of their data. Part of their vision is about being transparent and telling everybody how well we're doing or not doing. Um, and we're very much um, open to sharing uh, where we're not doing well as, as well as um, sharing what we are doing well. And we're doing particularly well at the, at the moment, but there are always problems. So we publish that. We've published a capital programme. We've published our estate walkabouts, and I'm, I'm pretty sure the parishes have been given that on several occasions. And it'd be great to see if parish councillors have got the time to join us on those walkabouts, um, where we walk across the, the various estates and, and pick, up, pick up issues that uh, might not be picked up otherwise. And tenants join us on that as well, and do district councils. Uh, so our focus since 2020, uh, 1st of October 2020, we went live. Um, so prior to that, we, we built the team. We got staff in place, but a whole load of staff came across from, from uh, East Kent um, on, on Tupi uh, on, on the 1st of October. And most of our time has been uh, in terms of building the team, making sure tenants are safe, improving for uh, performance and, and working with the regulator to move out of regulation. And that's going particularly well. So it's creating a whole new service. If you think about starting a service with a 16 million pound turnover, 97 staff, um, none of them had, or no, East Kent staff would have potentially worked together. 
Um, but bringing all those people together, both from East Kent, both and uh, from recruitment externally, bringing them together um, and creating the team and creating the, almost a seamless service so the tenants didn't see uh, a reduction in service, which I was expecting, but um, it, it didn't happen thanks to the team we, we created. Developing uh, tenant perception, improving the confidence of tenants in what we're, in what we're doing as well. Um, because they'd had quite a quite a difficult time, so m getting them to start to trust us. I mean, I, when I when I met the tenants, I, um, I didn't ask them to trust me, um, but Andy and I met with them and at the, their meeting. We said, well, you know, we will prove ourselves by the actions that we uh, we demonstrate. You know, this is our vision. Tenants are at the heart of what we're doing. We're going to improve the service. Judge us on what we do, not what we're saying, and that that's slowly happening. And critically at the end there is, is we did all this remotely. We did all this with COVID in, in, in place and we're still working, working through that. So we've improved performance. We improved the uh, gas servicing and the work on um, keeping um, tenants safe through fire or water, which is Legionella. Um, we were getting access into homes safely uh, so we could carry out this work and we were improving service uh, with, with a team that's, um, that's remote and hasn't hasn't really come to, well has not come together this i've still got um two i've got a uh, i work with three colleagues in my management team and two of those still have not met i've met them all but the two of those still haven't met yet because of covid and and other other issues so i said that tenants are very much at the heart of what we are doing and we absolutely mean it um you'll have heard about the grenfell uh, disaster with, with the tower block and everything's come really uh, from there in, in the housing world. The hearing the tenant's voice is a real term that's used. In Grenfell um, tenants were saying this block is not safe and they weren't being listened to. Hence the regulator has got increased powers. Um, there's a whole load of work coming through from the government's white paper to improve the services which uh, local authorities and housing associations give to their tenants. Now to be fair, we've got, we don't have a lot of, we don't have high rise. We've, we've got a good, well-maintained stock, so we don't have the problems, but we've all got to deal with the same legislation that's coming down. So we've created a, a strategic board that's still in the, in the mix. We had a meeting earlier this week where tenants accepted the, the way forward. We'll be advertising for tenants to join, to join that, that, uh, that group um, and really hold us to account so the purpose of the tenant's voice in this diagram here um, is they need to hold us to account. They need to say to me and to Andy uh, and to the politicians, the performance isn't good enough or it is good enough or you need to tweak it. And we really need to be listening to what they are saying to us. So scrutinize performance, <clears throat> be involved in what, we're, in what we're doing and having a view uh, in that as the customer and also how we do it but also broader links with the, the council as well, how they, they uh, are involved with the, the council's other, other areas of work. So having, having a, a role and a voice in, uh, in all of that. Spoke about performance earlier on. This, is, um, this, this chart here is an extract from what we see on a monthly, monthly basis. Um, when I see green, it's, it's good. Um, when, it's, uh, when it's red as a, uh, over here, um, it, it's not so good, and we're we're working um, through through these through these things. But critically, landlord compliance, which is the health and safety things, which are the things which the uh, regulator has been working with us on, and which East Kent Housing got themselves into trouble over, are are green. We've um, we're on on top of all this, and and have been on top of this for a, a number of months now in terms of providing safe safe services. Um, where it's not green, uh, that's because we have an ongoing program. So that one, if you can read it, um, that's uh, an electrical rewiring program, which is a two-year program, which will be finished in May 2022. And uh, we're, we're working on that. And that, I'm pleased to say, is on program. So we don't just say we want to be scrutinised. We, we publish our, our performance so that it goes to members, it goes to tenants. We publish it uh, online on our website. We monitor it weekly and it's reported monthly. And some of you may have seen um, um, a, a summary of our performance in the newsletter that we, we send out as well. And then looking forward, uh, which is really the exciting bit, is about moving out of regulation. And we're having really positive conversations with the regulator about that. 
having a stock survey being completed, and you may have seen surveyors going around uh, the council houses. We're looking at 100% of our, our stock to see what condition it's in, so we can get better intelligence about that stock, and we can produce a better a better business plan, um, and to meet some of the the, uh, the challenges that are coming down down the line. Uh, new computer system that's that's going in, um, and that will give us far more control and more information. And also enable tenants to be more online in terms of reporting repairs, for example, or seeing what their rent account's like. More, more fire protection works inevitably. Um, big one for every um, social landlord is net zero carbon, how we meet the zero carbon agenda by 2050. We've done a rough calculation that um, if we're going to retrofit all of our properties to be net zero carbon, it's going to be £68 million. Pounds. 68 million pounds. Now we have a turnover of 16 million pounds. So you can understand the implications of that. New build, um, no, no, uh, no gas boilers from 2025. That's the government uh, guidance on, on that requirement from the government on that. But we're also looking, I heard about Seedham Roofs earlier on. We're talking about those on, 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 on new build. We're talking about modern methods of construction. So new, new ways of building properties. Um, because there, there isn't the labour around, there, isn't, there aren't the number of bricklayers that you need to build the number of houses that the country needs, um, let alone what uh, we, we, we need. So it's finding new ways of, of constructing uh, council houses to, to good quality um, and, and, and quickly. So we're exploring that. And we're also exploring that along the lines of whether that could help to bring labour um, in, into the area as well. If you're developing a, a new sort of modular system, which is factory built, can some of the people in that factory be from uh, local, local, uh, well, lo local people? Of course, we have a by and large a local um, approach to to employing contractors as well. So looking after the Folkestone Folkestone pound digital agenda um, and lots to do, and and all of that is is done against um, this uh, our vision. So all the things I've spoken about throughout that is making sure that we are holding true to our vision and if we're doing something that doesn't either put the tenants at the heart of what we're doing um, and isn't delivering excellent service we, we, we question ourselves why we why we should be doing it. Um, I've mentioned a couple of things during that presentation and there's some links so our standards, um, our neighbourhood service, uh, neighbourhood inspection um, timetable and our performance are, uh, can be found at those links there and then uh, finally I'm happy to take uh, Questions, Chair. Thank you very much, John. That was a very comprehensive report there. I'll stop sharing, shall I? Is that? Yeah, yeah probably. It's best so you can go back to it. Okay. Paul. Uh, yeah, thank you, Frank. Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation, uh, John. Um, I've got two questions, if I may. Um, the first of those relates to something you've already touched on. Uh, which was to do the impact of Grenfell and the, um, you know, the government guidelines for doing um, inspections of cladding. Um, what, what sort of impact do you anticipate that that would have? Um, and when do you anticipate that cladding, building inspections where cladding could be an issue would be completed and therefore an understanding of what the issue could cost the district to correct? Okay, so I take that question first. Um, yes, if you don't mind, yeah. Yeah, um, it's not a problem for us. We, we don't have high rise. Um, all uh, social housing should by now have identified their, their cladding nationally, um, and, and we don't have it. So we have carried out uh, fire risk assessments on all of our, our properties. We know what the risks are. We know, for example, we had a number of uh, doors that needed replacing, and we've replaced, I think, about 130 doors in, in the last few months. Um, so and that, that was the kind of risk that we had. We, I'm really, really fortunate, unlike say some of our neighbors in Thanet, we don't have the same kind of risks that, um, that they have. So our risks are small, uh, but no less important, we've got a high proportion of shelter schemes. So we've got properties which we classify as high, high risk, not because they've got cladding on them, but because we've got more vulnerable tenants in those properties. Right, OK, thank you very much. Um, and I, I don't know if this is actually within your remit, um, but um, uh, th those properties in the district, which uh, are currently uh, abandoned, uncared for, um, 
is that something that you're also looking at in terms of the, you know, the, the amount of properties that we have that are currently not lived in that could do something to support, um, you know, the overall um, scheme um, of, uh, of, of having all properties um, lived in, if that makes sense? It does. Do you want yeah. me to come in there, John, or are you uh, good? Uh, although I was going to talk about Adrian's side of the business, Andy, but they're happy for you to pick it up. Yeah, um, we run an um, empty home scheme, um, which is called No Use Empty, which was we work with KCC. Uh, we identify as many empty properties um, as we can across the district and then try and engage um, with, the la- with the landlord or the um, owner. Uh, and we, It's been a very successful program. It's run for a number of years. I'll have to get the statistics for you, but I think we generally bring probably about between 150 and 200 properties back into life um every mm. year i can get some more sort of details um stats around that but yeah so we do run a program um it's with kent um and what happens is we provide loans to the um to the homeowner um to bring it back into use um and then obviously we have a charge against that um to get to get the loan back um at a later date and then that gets recycled into f- provide further funding for, for further no use empties um so hopefully that answers that yeah. It does, thank you very much. And I, I know a number of years ago, Russell Tilson was uh, successful in getting a couple of properties in New Romney back on the market. And we've we've identified a few others which we're tracking at the moment. And I know, uh, unfortunately, that there seems to be um, landlords who don't have the same standards that uh, uh, John's alluding to in terms of looking after their housing stock. So what, what particularly can be done with those landlords who are known to be um, repeat offenders for not looking after their properties um, and, and therefore, you know, their tenants are living in pretty poor conditions. So I'll pick that up. So again, it goes back to the other side of housing, which the council has always had um, and is part of the remit that uh, Andy just spoke about. Um, we have uh, a team that looks at the private sector and if people are, uh, landlords are uh, not living up to the standards that, that are required, we, we take action against it. We could take action against them. Um, we can have an improvement notice. So we've got quite stringent powers to improve. The, the key is that we need to know they're living there. So if people are subletting um, or not on their radar, um, and they should be, we've got people out and about. People tell us if there are you know, properties being, being sublet. So absolutely, the council has powers, and we have a very strong team that um, will pursue landlords that are, are not meeting the required standards. Okay, thank you for that. Um, can, can I just ask one more thing on that? Do, do you still operate um, a, a scheme whereby if a property is deteriorated to a particular point, then you will actually consider, you know, buying that property and bringing it into your own housing stock? Is that something that, that you do? That's just for my information, really. I, I don't know if we've done that, Andy. I, um... well, it would be um, probably, there's no scheme um, in place. Mm. It would be a case-by-case yeah, it, we, we would take a view depending on the sort of the detriment to the neighbourhood. Uh, it's not something we would pursue. We would normally pursue um, through planning notices um, if there was something untoward or any sort of danger to the public. Uh, we would pursue it from a planning notice, a planning enforcement perspective. Um, there have been cases in the past. Uh, it's, it's not something we regularly pursue, um, but it would be considered if the planning notices didn't have the desired effect. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Sir. It's just, we, we do have two properties on the seafront, which we're tracking at the moment. And, and I believe we have been in contact with you through um, through our district councillors as well, that belong to a, a very well-known, larger-than-life uh, landlord uh, who has a number of properties in, uh, um, in Kent, unfortunately. But thank you very much for that, Andy. I appreciate that. No problem. All right, and then last one. Uh, yeah, my thanks for that presentation. My question is really about uh, social housing within the villages. Um, obviously, people tend to um, associate social housing with perhaps poorer areas where there's a greater need for housing. But within the villages, which is sometimes quite affluent, that in itself generates the need for social housing because we sometimes find a lot of our young people want to work in and around the village. But because the area is so affluent they can't actually afford any form of housing so when you're monitoring your stock do you take a view of um, procuring social housing within the villages and perhaps some more affluent areas that don't appear to need social housing when they 
sometimes do. Yeah, well, uh, well a, a development strategy, absolutely, yeah. So we've got the development strategy, which identifies need, and then our, our both our new build um, would, would follow where that need would, would be if we're doing it ourselves. Um, but also we uh, in, encourage housing associations to be doing doing the same. Uh, so we would be working with them to help identify where the need is and whether indeed they would want to to build in those areas such as the such as the villages. Uh, now obviously we, we've got a, a major development coming up around Lim uh, Otterpool Park, which obviously has a number of allocations for social housing. Do you have any clout as far as ensuring there is delivery on social housing and it comes into the districts? I, I'll just say a bit. And then I, I know Andy's got to say a bit. And that's absolutely <laughs> right. <laughs> we are absolutely involved in that from a social housing perspective. My colleague Adrian is, is talking with um, uh, Otterpool. Um, we we uh, we will have our our allocation of that. Um, but we also have a, a view on what that should be looking like. So we are in a very strong position to influence what's happening on Otterpool so that you've not got housing associations just kind of um, coming in delivering what they, they want. And we, we meet on a regular basis, well, my colleagues meet on a regular basis with um, uh, the, the, the team that's developing Otterpool. But, and, and is more up um, close and personal to that. Hi, Hi, thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, we're looking at about... There's probably about a 30% allocation across Otterpool, um, as with all of our developments. Um, obviously, if that stacks up financially when you're talking about other developments, but generally your affordable allocation is about 30%. Uh, we are looking at that for Otterpool. Um, I have been, I have regular communication with the directors of the LLP, which is the company that's running that for us, which is obviously owned by the council. Uh, we're looking to bring some of that forward quite early on in the development. Um, but I think out of that 30% of affordable housing, we would probably want to be bringing about a third of that into the council stock and very keen to do that starting as early as phase one. Um, so yeah, hopefully that, that answers your question. But I, I, I guess more widely, we've got quite an ambitious program. Uh, I mean, the leader of the council, Councillor Monk, um, the year before last said that we're going to build a thousand new council homes. Um, on top of the existing program that we already have, which was to de deliver 300 across the five year period up to 2015. We've pledged to build another thousand um, following that period for the next 10 years. Um, now, now that is a tall order. We've got to find the land for that. We're currently working. Uh, our main focus, should I say, has been sort of bringing the service back in house and getting out of regulation with the housing regulator and making sure that all our houses are safe and fit for occupation. That is as John has previously described, has been going really well. Um, so a, a big next step is developing our asset management framework and how we build these properties. So we're working with um, various local developers to bring houses forward. Um, we work with other developers through planning contributions, so 106 um, allocations, things like that. And then it's developing our own um, development arm as well, if you like. So this is a sort of multi-stranded approach um, to, to how we tackle this, because it it's a big number. Uh, and that was before this was announced, before the carbon agenda it was quite so prominent and before the council had committed to being carbon zero um, by 2030. So as John alluded to earlier, there's big, big numbers around retrofitting our existing stock. So we need to understand the impact of that on the finances, because we, we, at the end of the day, we've got to make sure that it's a viable business moving forward. We can't spend more than we have. Um, obviously, the more houses we have, the more rent we have coming in and therefore, but, but it's all very finely balanced because we have to work all those finances out against housing allowance and stuff. And then obviously looking at that over a 30 year period. Um, but we are looking, uh, we will work with developers across the district in all areas. Um, Otterpool will be a good supply um, for our own housing stock. But yeah, we're, we're open to conversations with developers. We're, we're having so many conversations at the moment. Um, and John, John spoke about MMC and offsite manufacture. So how we minimize that carbon footprint, um, but also how we create new places, new spaces. And we don't want, we, our, our aspiration is that you'll walk into an area where, which might be predominantly our council houses, but you won't be able to tell the difference between that and everything else. It's reducing that stigma around social housing. Uh, and I'm very passionate about placemaking and things like that and, and, and how we bring landscape into 
housing and uh, and all, all things like that so there's loads and loads of work and that's what's really exciting about our job and and what we've got to do now moving forward now we've got a steady base to work from we can really start attacking sort of these other areas um so not fully fledged yet an awful lot of work to do i say we're putting an asset management framework together this year and then writing a new business plan um to see what we can afford to do but it's got to take into account not just building those new houses it is retrofitting that existing estate and I think looking at that is probably that's probably more likely to be closer to 100 million than 70 million that we that we we said earlier. They're big, big numbers, mm. um, but conversations we're having. You're generally looking at about 35,000 pounds per three bed house as an average. Um, and then some of our stock won't be be able to be retrofitted to that standard. Um, so we have to have discussions about that disposals policy. Uh, and then acquisitions off the back of that, and how how we buy land, and how it all stacks up, and how it's all viable. Um, so it's a big, big job, and we've got some really good people on board. Um, I'm really pleased with where we are now, um, bringing the service back in house, sort of not even a year on, uh, uh, and what I look at as a service now. Um, but yeah, the exciting part now moving forward is that whole development and the retrofitting and delivering everything we need to deliver against that. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that. I mean, I'm I'm really pleased that. Uh it's being brought back in house. I'm sure that's the, the, the best way forward for the district. And uh, I'll quote the 30% next time I meet uh, Andy and Julia at Otterpool uh, meeting. Thanks for that. It was interesting, Andy, to hear you say about integrating them into the, into the other houses, because that was one thing we noticed when we had the visit down to Poundbury, that you couldn't tell unless they told you which were the... Um, social housing and which were privately owned. There was no difference between them. Mm. And it, it, they, they said there that part of that was due to the fact that because they were mixed in together, that the social housing tenants made sure they looked after their property in terms of how it looked. Um, so they didn't look as though they were um, as deprived, I suppose you could say, because mm. otherwise they wouldn't be in, in social housing. If it helps, um, Chair, again, I, I mentioned the regulated social housing and the white paper. What the government's also asking us to look at is, and they, it's called reducing the stigma of social housing. Um, that's another requirement that's being placed on us to, and, and rightly so. Um, and and I, I, well, in some areas, you can walk around and you can potentially see the difference in council properties that have been maintained and some of the properties that we've sold that, that, that haven't been as well. So there's, that, that's another way of, unfortunately, uh, distinguishing. Sorry, I interrupted there. That's all right. That's loud. you've got your hand up. Yeah, sorry, I didn't hear you, Frank. Sorry. Uh, thanks very much for that presentation. My, my background in, in my early years was in housing, housing maintenance, um, and, I was, I was particularly taken back by your, um, your business plan and your, your planning for the future. Um, there's, there, there's always um, catch up repairs, cyclical, cyclical repairs and, and capital works obviously to, to do, um, vast amounts of it normally. Um, are, you, are you comfortable with the, um, with the uh, revenue funds that you've got coming in from rents and and um, your, the, your capital um, receipts to uh, to carry out the the, the catch-up repairs and the, and the maintenance work have you got enough if you you've got enough um, capital expense capital uh, funds coming in to, to tackle all the work that's needed to your stock, um, 3,400 400 houses, I think you said. Yeah. Um, because it's always it's always a huge problem, and and uh, I think Andy mentioned, you know, that you probably your program will probably extend to about 20 odd years, um, and it's always going to be ongoing. Um, that's that's one part of the question, and the second part is that, do you foresee a, a time? Do you foresee a time when you may um, may need is some help and both the both the council district councils that i worked for in the end um sought help from housing associations to to manage their stock um 
it probably seems unpalatable at the moment, um, but it's something that um, other councils have been forced to do. You're right, so too quick. Have we got enough money to manage the stock? Um, the, the council, its wisdom, were good enough to put an additional capital uh, allowance in for when the new um, housing service started. So we've got a significant amount of money to, 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 to go at. Um, I mentioned the stock survey um, and getting more intelligence about the stock. So we need that to start with, and we're looking at 100% external and 90% internal of the stock. So we should have a very good idea of what is, what is, what is needed. Now, we've got a business, as Andy said, it's a business. It runs with the rent that comes in, and then you either borrow money or, or you spend revenue. So we've got to manage within those, those confines. Um, but until we've got the, uh, the stock survey completed, we won't, I couldn't put a hand on heart and say we've got everything. But we would plan over the 30 years, and that's, that's the time horizon that the housing revenue account business plan is um, developed for. And if there's any shortcomings, we, we would identify those at the outset. Um, and if we've got that stock survey in place, we can then be more efficient in terms of our delivery. So, um, you know, if we're going to do roofing, we'll repair the chimney at the same time, those kinds of things. So when you put the scaffold in at once, what is going to be a challenge for us is meeting that carbon agenda. Um, so we need to understand the full impact of, of that. And that's... Um, a challenge for every social housing organization across the across the country so lots of them for example have cut back on new build because they're putting money either into their fire prevention works or into the the uh, the, the carbon agenda so we'll be uh, in a much better position uh, early next year to put hand on heart and say this is what we can we can can achieve with the money that we've got given uh, the more information on the stock the um the uh, Housing Association uh, question, that's a, kind of a political question, isn't it? But my, my view is no, I've worked for housing associations and, uh, and Almos, and we've just spent an awful lot of time, energy and effort in setting up a brilliant housing uh, organisation in-house. I, um, uh, I don't see that we should be bringing, uh, uh, putting the housing stock out to a, a housing association. In fact, we, you know, it was out with an Almo. That's failed. We've just bought it. We just bought it um, in-house. And across the country, a lot of organisations now are bringing their ALMOs back in, back in house um, for a number of reasons, efficiency, cost um, and improved control. That would be my view, but I'm not a politician. Thank you very much. Paul. Oh. Yeah, thank you, Craig. I have one more question, actually. Um, uh, what, what experience do you have on retrofit of ground source and air source heat pumps? Um, that allows you to put, you know, reasonable figures to how much it would cost to retrofit a particular property in a particular area. Um, do you have that? Is that something you can draw from from other parts of the country? Yeah, it's a good, good question. I mean, grounds, ground source, I mean, ground source is, is not drilling down to the core of the earth. Don't forget, the ground source is laying um, big, um, uh, big areas of cables kind of a meter down and drawing the energy out. So we're looking at that at one of our new build schemes, for example, Highview. Um, and it brings in to a whole question uh, around the, the economy of, it's probably the way forward, that's the current thinking, um, ground source and air source, it's current thinking, but then they've got to be run with electric. So you also you can't just look at this in isolation. You've got to, you'll hear the term fabric first, you've got to insulate the property first so that it's as efficient as possible. Then if you're going to put these other products in, you've got to think, do we have PV panels on the roof to run the electric, to run the ground and heat source? So it, it isn't one size fits all. And, and it's slightly more complex than that. And it's exciting. You can tell that from the way I'm, I'm talking. But the, um, we, we've got the hydrogen agenda coming up. So if we're going to put in products at the moment, they've got to be hydrogen ready and there's clean and dirty hydrogen, and don't ask me the difference between the two. Um, so we're not putting in something that we've got to rip out in a, in a couple of years' time. The, one of the big challenges we've got is, is what help is the government going to give us in terms of grant? Because, you know, we can't find that 16.9 million, and it's a lot more So it's, uh, from the housing revenue account for other organisations. So what, what um, is going to come down the line from in terms of grant? Um, but also there's technology... You know, we're thinking now about current technology. 
there must be technology in the future between 2030 and 2050 that hasn't been thought about yet that will come online to help us. And battery storage, for example, you know, how do we improve the battery storage that we can generate electricity in the summer through, through solar power and store it for the winter? Now, we can, we've got batteries that last for maybe weeks, but, but not, not years at the moment. So that kind of technology. And then the final part of that jigsaw is the national grid will need to be decarbonized as well. So we'll take the properties to a certain element, but unless they're totally off grid, all the time electricity is being produced by coal fired or gas fired, we're not going to be carbon, carbon neutral. So it's a partnership across, across the piece and getting all those bits of the jigsaw in place and not doing something now that we're going to have to rip out in five, 10 years time. It's really exciting. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, thank you very much for that. That's a great answer. Thank you. I appreciate that. So um, invest in small modular reactors would be my uh, would be my response to that. Thank you. Okay. Especially <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? No, well, thank you very much, John and Andy, for your input tonight. And uh, been very useful. I hope that uh, the council, our councillors that are here can take away what they've heard and pass it on. So, Good, thank you very much, Councillor. Thank you. I'll, uh, we'll leave. Thank you. Bye -bye. Good night. Thank you Good night. Night. Thanks, John. Uh, any, other, any other business? A couple of things I wanted to say is one, um, we had the um, planning forum on CIL and 106s the other night, but there were only six parishes represented there out of the 30 that were invited, uh, which was very disappointing. Whether it's what the reason is, we need to talk at our next area committee meeting about various um, options on that. Um, I know Kate's um, has got that in mind as well. Um, it was very interesting. It, it, as far as I was concerned, it, it turned over one thing which I was thought was wrong originally, but is now um, proved to be different to what I thought it was, and that is the, the cap on the amount that goes out to the parish council. Um, it's only, it sounded originally as though it was a hundred pounds per house. It's not. It's £100 for every house in the parish. So if you've got a parish with 100 houses, your still limit is £10,000. Not £100 altogether. Um, uh, some, as a matter of interest, those of you who are here, how many of you have actually had any still money come in? Any of you? Uh, yes, Paul. Uh, no, just uh, I'm just to reinforce what you're saying, really, Frank. That the fact that there was a lot of useful information came out um, of of that uh, of that meeting, and uh, like you say, we just need to encourage everybody to to understand uh, what they need to do to, to be able to draw down on this. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Okay. Um, I can't find I can't find it at the moment without losing all of you. But I had an email um, from Susan. Great. Oh, whether it was you or Susan, Kate, about um, somebody from the health um, that was held over hasn't been hasn't been brought in. Yes. Oh, is that, is that a, um, the health services update? Yes. That you wanted on the agenda. Yeah, I think Susan was after um, a, an outside lead on that rather than a district lead. Um, it might be something we need to talk to Councillor Hollinsby about, yeah, because she uh, she has more experience in in that. Okay. But I think she I think Susan Priest was thinking that um, there's nobody really within the district council that could lead on that. We need somebody maybe to come in from one of the healthcare services or something to do with the NHS or I think that's what her thinking was. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Anything else anybody wants to have a word about? Can, can I just mention the planning forum again, that we do have a provision yeah. date in the diary for 
Thursday the 28th of October. Um, I've kind of managed to tie down Llewellyn and you and their diaries are free that evening. So um, I will be sending out uh, uh, an invite and a reminder, but it'll be nearer the time. And I'll be asking for, for any any items that you, you want brought forward. Thank you. Um, we might need to think about the timing of it, might we? They've been at five o'clock. Now, is that the reason why we haven't had a very good response, or is it just we haven't had a very good response? Mm. Is it something it's something you you said you was going to bring up at the calc meeting? Yes. Be uh, it might be not worth asking there. Um, I mean, it, bearing in mind it is a remote meeting, so it should be fairly easy for people to join. Yeah. Yeah, when, when we had the face-to-face -face meetings um, um, in, in the Boulogne room, uh, we used to invite, the, you know, the planning class, those people with that responsibility. Um, and, and again, you know, I think that just broadened the number of people who, who did come. Although I have to say that for most of the time, um, you know, we still only had six or eight people in the room, Frank, even when we even when we broadened it. So yeah. um, I, I think there's, like you say, you know, we just need to make sure that through the calc group, we just need to demonstrate the benefit of actually being able to um, get items on an agenda and, and show the, you know, how productive those uh, two sessions have been, Frank. Yeah. Okay. okay. Is there anything else? Yeah. If not, we'll say thank you for attending. Um, I'll see you on Saturday, Paul. Uh, you, you want you want to see me, Frank? Uh, oh. I'm just going to oh, stop right. the live stream. Councillor Hobbs, you close the meeting.